All right, so I think we're ready to start with our last session of the day uh, prior to VMware and beer. Um, so we have Rory Power from Demonware, uh, and he's here to talk about uh, his work. I believe he's been with Demonware for five years, and uh, his work helping them scale out at massive growth. So uh, Rory Power. Thanks very much. So I'm aware it's me between you guys and beer, so I'll try and not talk much past five o'clock if I can at all help it. So the first question when I mention Puppet and Demonware is obviously, who are Demonware? So I'll start with that and um, try and give you a bit of a history of Demonware and our growth and what do we actually do. Um, we didn't even have a website up until maybe a year or two ago. So uh, we're very, um, not exactly uh, a public organization. Um, so I'll explain that and, and motivate it for you guys. So I'll look at our early Puppet approaches, basically how we did things badly. Um, I find that's much more interesting than how people have perfect systems. Um, nice to know that other people make uh, the same mistakes as, as we have. Uh, I'll sort of look at the current state and what we've been doing to our, our Puppet install, and uh, then look at new improvements that uh, we've been adding software, we've been coding to make our life with Puppet easier, and then talk about the, the future uh, of, uh, of Demware, and then take questions. So what do we do? So, we host the online infrastructure for all Activision video games. Um, so that means lobby services, which uh, basically consist of when somebody fires, fires up their uh, PlayStation or Xbox, they connect to our services, and that's what connects them to their friends. So we do all the services effectively for PlayStation, and also for Xbox, um, we have taken over from Microsoft and Xbox Live a lot of uh, the functionality that they had done um, previously. So uh, we are effectively it as far as Call of Duty is, uh, is concerned on all platforms. So we take care of when people get a score, they store their results in the leaderboard, we store their, um, their loadouts in the game, in uh, our storage systems, we let them message their friends. Um, we do this, we have this, this special platform for Windows because you need a special proxy to talk with over the Microsoft network. And we offer web service access to all of our services because obviously the web is a big thing and um, there are various websites that will want to hook into game data, which previously was just in a silo and nobody could really get to it. Um, so we, uh, we give access to that um, via web services to various uh, to various uh, services. The main one at the moment being Elite, which is the, the um, premium Call of Duty service. So we're the one, Elite is the front end website that uh, gives you access to your stats if you play the game. Um, and then they talk to us on the back end. And we're also doing this for their, uh, for mobile games, which Activision are getting into more and more. So where did we come from? So we started hosting these services in uh, 2005. We grew quite a bit and we had lots of uh, customers, um, basically everybody except EA, um, and then our biggest uh, customer, Activision, uh, decided to, to buy us out, um, so that they'd get us exclu exclusively. Um, at that stage, we didn't have any big games. There was, uh, you know, 20,000 concurrent users was a big title. Um, there were only a few of us in, in the company, um, and then... Uh, we were acquired as, as was, but we had no automation. We had a very small infrastructure and so on. So we do Call of Duty. Um, it's basically the, the one big thing we've done since, uh, since we joined. Call of Duty 4 was my, uh, my first one, and uh, this year we'll be re releasing Black Ops 2. Um, we kind of have this down. It, it's almost boring to us now. Um, so, uh, but we are used to delivering uh, uh, big games at, at scale. So the other games we have, the only two that are really significant would be Guitar Hero and uh, Skylanders games. With Skylanders is, well, Guitar Hero is the one with the plastic guitars. Everyone knows Skylanders is the, um, the game where you buy a collection of toys and you put them on a portal and then they appear in the game. And the rest are much smaller, but quite a lot of games because we, re we reuse our infrastructure. So we've actually been in 90 plus titles in total. So that's just some stats about what we do. 280 million gamers, 2.4 million concurrent online gamers. Um, so that's people, you know, active TP TCP connection to our service, server. And I'll leave the rest of it in uh, interest of time. So we started off with Puppet. Um, effectively as a skunkworks project to get our hosts installed. 
Um, there was no particular design because there was no time to have a design. You just um, we just adopted it as fast as we could to get uh, to get machines installed. Um, so we did a lot of bad things. If we needed to make a change to a core class um, that uh, seemed dangerous that we didn't want to do, we'd make a copy of that class, edit that class instead, and apply that class to a host, um, which obviously meant a vast explosion in the number of puppet classes um, on your system. Um, yeah, there was no conditionals uh, in the in the code to help decide what uh, should be installed on the um, a particular machine via the template. Um, it was just direct uh, copy of the um, copy of the template. Uh, people put passwords in, into our code, which meant we could then not share our uh, system configuration with our developers, which is a very bad uh, idea. They would do the canonical bad example of use puppet file resource to copy over shell script and then exec that shell script. Um, so we used that for to setting up MySQL users. And part of that, it would uh, change the MySQL root password so that the script wouldn't work again. So that was perfect and safe, obviously. Um, we realized it was bad, but that's where we were at the time. Um, yeah, our inventory came from a, a, a spreadsheet. That was the only place we had it. So we had to duplicate it so that we could write an ENC to, um, to connect to a MySQL database. And we used NoOp in production, um, which, uh, which saved when people who didn't understand how, how Puppet worked um, made mistakes. It saved catastrophes effectively, but really slowed us down. Um, and thankfully, we've got, gotten rid of it as of recently. So in 2010, we got a chance to effectively work on our Puppet code and do it correctly, because we moved from Ubuntu as our, our platform to CentOS. Um, so we completely wrote, rewrote it from the ground up, obviously. Um, it did things properly, proper dependencies, et cetera. We added custom types. Um, we added a password lookup function, which I'll, I'll describe later. So we had various custom types we wrote. They're very simple once you, you actually get them done. Uh, I think there was a, um, a, Ruby, a Ruby Puppet development uh, course somewhere. I think you should go and do that. Um, it, it's definitely worthwhile because uh, it, it's uh, so worth it when you need to do that one thing that's kind of niggling you and you're tempted to use a shell script to solve it. Um, they're, they're very good um, and not too difficult at all. Um, Yet we also uh, came up with a, a generic MySQL module that we used for our multiple services, um, which could then include our, our, if you wanted to run a, a particular service, you would just set up your users, set up your databases, include MySQL. And that's all you needed to do. And so many of our dash DB classes are just that. And it makes them very, very maintainable. And we also manage systems um, through custom types. So to get around that problem where we had, uh, we had password, um, passwords directly put into our, our templates, uh, we wrote a, a custom function which just looks up the, um, uh, a particular password by name for a particular service. So uh, then we configure the, the passwords on the Puppet Master separate to our, our version control for our Puppet modules, um, which lets us then share out the modules without sharing secrets because that's one of the most important parts of, um, of Puppet to me is rather than there being this data center that ops control and there being the devs over there who actually know the software, that hopefully we can exchange the, um, exchange the config and um, promote sharing between the, the two groups. So that was very useful for us. Um, so we then moved to from hold, um, maintaining our own database of machines and their, their roles and IP addresses, et cetera. We integrated to our, into our own internal Django app called DevZone, uh, which is effectively our management app. It does a lot of other things as well. Um, it's the, the game developer in, interface. So when people are actually, the people who actually make the games rather than host the service, um, they use DevZone to interact with us and basically describe the, the schema for their games is the best way I can explain that. Um, so we hooked into that because that also managed all our hosts and their, their roles and the particular titles that they were, um, were managing. Um, so uh, what that, that allowed us to do was, um, oh yeah, it also has this, uh, this internal uh, config interface, which we use for configuring our application services. 
and it has a double sign-off of changes. So integrating into um, into DevZone helps with uh, help with that because uh, it gives us an idea of uh, how we can use this this double sign-off thing. So it's, uh, in this inventory database, there's all the um, the details of the, the individual servers need to be kept anyway for billing purposes. So um, so we just hooked into that and. Uh, added what we needed effectively, which is the puppet modules that should be applied to each host. Um, so the RENC script was a Python script which connected to this um, inventory database and makes an API call for the, the puppet classes that should be on the machine, um, what network uh, config it has, what subcluster it is, um, which effectively means what, what uh, config it gets. Um, there's simple conditions in, in that Python script to add extra output. Um, for the particular subcluster, which DevZone doesn't know about. Um, but unfortunately, you need to update this ENC script whenever, um, whenever you want to change those extra, extra conditionals, um, which uh, wasn't great because it's, it's very brittle. And it is, was effectively one, uh, one file um, which you could, you could stomp on it, someone else's changes quite easily. So we wrote this thing called BD Puppet Config. Um, the BD prefix basically just means daemonware. It's from BitDemon, which was our, one of our old product names. Um, so BD config, just as itself, um, we wrote internally as a standard for configuring our services. Um, so we use that for our main application server already. Um, so about a year ago, um, the guy who wrote this was presenting it at an internal conference, and about four of us in the room had the, the idea of, well, if we're using that for our main application server, can we not just take that and, uh, and use it for our, our public configuration? Um, so it's effectively a client server, the daemon and client, and it, um, it lets us integrate into DevZone, because it, uh, so into our internal management app, because uh, it uses the same uh, configuration setup as our, our core services. So uh, it lets us view how the service is configured, and it will um, let, uh, let our developers push out config changes um, to live environments uh, st straight away, effectively, with the same, um, the same double sign-off system as we have for all our other configuration uh, changes. So that's quite important for us, I think, is to um, to shorten the path between the developers wanting to make a config change and it actually happening in production. Um, yeah, and it also lets us, we have a, uh, started a 24-7 knock, um, so it, who are contractors, so basically lets, as we bring people in, we can check the changes they want to make, get them, um, make sure they're valid, not entirely crazy, and then let them through. So this is just some details on what, uh, what we do. We define a schema for uh, all of the variables associated with each puppet class um, inside the root of each module so we can version them separately. Um, it gives us uh, particular types, We're very useful to uh, sysadmins, like a host, which is a host name and IP, et cetera. Um, yeah, and they're versioned per puppet branch to make it, uh, make it obvious then what, uh, what config variables we have available. And then that's presented graphically inside our config tool to, um, to configure them. So we're in the process of rolling this out yet. It's not done yet. Unfortunately, we've hit a busy time of year, but uh, we're going to roll this out slowly as we, uh, as we come along. So I think everyone has probably had issues with, uh, with SSL certs in, uh, in Puppet. It's definitely a, a pain point. It's not very difficult. It's just frequently annoying. Um, we have many Puppet Masters across three different data centers. Um, so we run into this all the time. Um, so we came up with the solution of uh, running our own CA that um, maintain, uh, generates and maintains certs for uh, all, our, all our Puppet clients. So it effectively means that the, whether the no matter what client, the, uh, what Puppet Master the client is connected to, um, it always has the same cert. So it lets us uh, switch um, switch uh, hosts between Puppet Masters very easily. Um, so effectively what it does is it just runs and you can request a tarball which, um, which gives the, uh, the public and private keys to the, the client. So we can do this at install time um, and it, uh, it 
we integrate that into our build process, and it basically makes the uh, server config much faster. Um, so with one catapult per data center, we don't need any more. We could probably have one globally, but it's better to have a bit of redundancy. So it uh, returns the, the cert bundle to the node by looking up the IP address in our management app, and also directs the, uh, the client to the appropriate puppet master um, by writing the, the server equals line. So obviously to do this, we disabled the built-in Puppet CA. Um, uh, yeah, it lets us move the Puppet Masters uh, without needing to restart. Um, it will also let us, we don't do it at the moment, but um, it will let us cluster the Puppet Masters uh, without needing the sh shared storage. Um, at the, we really want to get our Puppet Masters to be, you know, we could blow them away and recreate them at any time. But unfortunately, with the certs on them, they're not, uh, they're not that at the moment. Um, it's a bit more secure than auto sign uh, of certs because we have control by our inventory of what certs get generated and are valid. Um, so it's an improvement in, in that department. So the other tool we wrote to, um, to help in our environment was Pragmatic. Um, this is someone else's work as was, uh, was Catapult. So uh, excuse, I don't know all the details, but it's a report aggregator just uh, operates as an external uh, report terminus. Um, so it collects, uh, processes reports which are sent to it by the Puppet Master, um, whatever it finishes the run, uh, determines the state of the run, and sends a, a passive check to Nagios um, to let it know what the, the status of the run was. And then Nagios can just, if it doesn't re receive a report in four hours, mark the status of the, um, of the node as, as unknown, um, which is great. Um, it, it actually gives us, rather than, um, rather than just what we previously did was check for a running puppet process, but it could just be there failing continuously. Um, so this, uh, this gives us exactly what we need, basically, to get our knock guys to go in and, uh, and um, check out and find out what's wrong. So we also use Garrett, which is a, uh, a code review tool, um, not designed for puppet uh, particularly. Um, but we use it to manage our, our Puppet modules. So we clone from a regular Git, Git repository. Um, we then push out to Garrett, and uh, then the change is staged there, by, and someone can review it by a, web, uh, by a website, um, it's showing side-by-side -side diffs, et cetera. Um, and then as soon as a person clicks Submit to have a double sign-off on the, the Puppet code change, um, then the, the change is made live. It's pushed back to the, uh, the real um, Git server. Uh, and then once the, the change has gone to the, our Git repo, it's then pushed out to our, our multiple data centers. Uh, and we can run different versions of, of, um, of our code on different, uh, different puppet masters. But uh, at the moment, we're trying to uh, consolidate towards, uh, towards having a single branch for manageability. So I've got two minutes left. Um, so, oh, even more, nice. Um, so where are we going from here? Um, we're still growing. Uh, keep on doing the next Call of Duty for whatever, uh, whatever year it happens to be, add one. Um, the Elite website is obviously a big thing. We need to support that and keep sure that, make sure that uh, keeps growing. Activision have a 10-year deal signed with Bungie uh, for their next IP that we'll be involved in. Um, various mobile games that Activision are, are rolling out. Um, we're also involved in uh, COD Online, which is a free-to-play version of, of Call of Duty, which is releasing in China. And uh, there's also the next-gen consoles, whenever they actually get released, um, we'll be involved there, making sure our code runs on the consoles, and we host whatever services the, the game developers uh, help us, uh, help us um, run. So. We're hiring, we'll take a tree slide. And does anyone have any questions? Sorry, what version of? Uh, it varies 2.6 mostly, I think. Uh, we're, effect we're trying to, um, for our newer Puppet Masters, we try and roll out the latest version. Uh, we're also migrating to CentOS 6. So that's basically just trying to make sure it all, all works together. But uh, we're, 
we're not going to be moving to, to Puppet 3 just yet, but we want to stay at least not too far behind the curve. Anyone else? Good, yeah. So reasons for moving from Ubuntu to CentOS, um, they were entirely business driven, shall I say, and they were um, effectively around support. Um, there was a, um, we came to the end of an LTS uh, in Ubuntu, um, and then they were releasing the next LTS, but we didn't feel that was stable enough. Um, and they, the business effectively wanted to move to, to CentOS. It just, uh, they felt it was more, more reliable releases. Uh, Did they no. Here? Are any of those internal tools available externally? Not at the moment. Um, I will say they're not massively complicated. Um, they definitely, you know, we do have an open source policy, but not the time to actually get our code reviewed so that we can release it as open source. Um, mostly what I'm presenting here is not stuff I can release or sell to you. That's not how, that's not what our company does. Um, at least I hopefully give you the ideas of the pain points we had and the code we wrote to try and fix it. But um, there's certainly something you could, you could uh, code up yourself in not too long. Um, but it's, it's something on our minds, certainly, that these are generally useful tools. They don't have our IP embedded in them. We'll certainly look at trying to release them as open source. Anyone else? Sorry. Oh, the, um, so the question is, so we store our database passwords well, in the database. We actually store them in a, a plain file. Um, but the, the question was, what's to stop the developer getting access to the passwords the same way Puppet does? Um, so the developers don't have access to our data centers. Um, we control that. Any access we give them is very, very limited. Um, the passwords themselves live only on the Puppet Master. Um, and that's where the, the custom function runs. So it literally reads, runs on the Puppet Master when the catalog's being compiled, reads them from the local Puppet Master, and fills them in into the templates. But the code itself just has that call of the function in it. So we can then just give our devs the, the code, and they can see effectively everything except for the password that would be, would be filled in. But it, it's literally, they're, they're not even on the same network as the password, so that they couldn't get to it. Any other questions? Unless there's one I'm missing, I think we're good. Thanks very much.